Professor Alex Johnson from the Rowett Institute at the University of Aberdeen and Craig Wilson from Eat on the Green at Adney Green and Chloe McKean from the Food Foundation. Is that right, Chloe? Thank you. Phew, got that right. Um, so without further ado, I'll just hand over to them and let them get on with it. Thank you. So um, thank you, Jenny. I'm going to um, say thank you for everybody for joining us tonight. Um, it's always great to meet new people and um, share um, some of the discussions that we've been having about healthy and sustainable food in Scotland. So if I'm sharing my screen, if I just do a quick um, technology check would I keep rambling on, is that okay? Yeah, you can see that. Thumbs up. Brilliant. Okay. So tonight's plan, as Jani said, um, I've got a short presentation to give to you uh, for 10 minutes. And then we've got a pre-record of Craig doing his wonderful cooking uh, out at Ugney. Um, and that is um, 20 minutes. And then passing over to Chloe, who um, will speak for 10 minutes, and then there's plenty of time at the end uh, for the audience to have a chat. Uh, so please do submit your uh, questions and uh, we'll be looking forward to enjoying discussing that with you. So I'm based at the Rowett Institute and I really wanted to make a personal commitment to support COP26. Um, I had the pleasure of presenting down uh, in Glasgow, uh, was an invited speaker uh, on a session on behaviour change. So really wanted to follow that up with um, thinking about exploring through the Tech Fest uh, event, uh, what are sustainable and healthy foods and diets? So just to remind you, sustainable diets are really an issue because of planetary population growth. Um, is thought to be around about 9 billion by the year 2050 and this trying to support this trend of western style eating will mean that we need to produce more food in particular meat and uh, meat based products like milk and it's estimated that the demand for animal protein in particular is expected to increase by about 80%. So this really puts a strain on the uh, environment because this uh, has an impact on greenhouse gas emission. I'm going to show you an infographic about that. Um, certainly if you're not sure about those links, then I can explore more detail with you. So I'm thinking here about the whole food chain. It's not just uh, farmers, it's transport, cooking and waste disposal all can contribute to environmental damage. But I don't want to think about that negatively. It means there are huge opportunities to change our food system, to reduce this greenhouse gas emission uh, in the way that we uh, prepare and consume our food. At the bottom of the screen, I've put in the sort of formal definition of sustainable diets um, from the UN. It's interesting that it needs to be protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems. They, of course, need to be culturally acceptable, accessible to all, economically fair and affordable, and interestingly, because I'm a nutritionist, nutritionally adequate, safe, healthy, whilst still optimising natural and human resources. So this is actually quite a challenge because often uh, food systems can be sustainable or healthy, but often the challenge is to make them both sustainable and healthy. So this is the infographic that I said I would share. I quite like this because it's a visual representation of the food system, which is farm to fork. And it highlights that processes in the food and agricultural system that lead out to greenhouse gas emissions and population health outcomes. So the food that we uh, produce can impact on greenhouse gas emissions, but also the food that we consume can impact on health. And it's how can we maximise this whole system here to have both a positive environmental impact, but also an positive impact on our health. And that's actually quite challenging, isn't it? So the concept of a sustainable diet really highlights that there's some environmentally unsustainable practices, uh, particularly what I would say in affluent societies. And in theory, a sustainable diet is one that can minimise this environmental damage, but at the same time is able to support a resilient farming and food industry and ensures that people have a healthy and nutritionally balanced diet. 
So thinking about the protein sources in the UK, um, this is from our National Diet and uh, Health Survey. And we can see here that in the right hand box, I've put it in much larger text, chicken and poultry dishes tend to be the top uh, type of protein that we consume. So that's white meat, uh, followed by beef, baked beans, eggs, bacon and hams, meat pies, oily fish, sausages, pork and white fish, uh, which is usually fried. And I think it's interesting when I look at that, I think it's interesting to see that the only known uh, animal source of protein there is in fact the baked beans that I've highlighted in green. So I think we really have some way to go to encourage a shift towards plant-based eating. And there's another way of thinking about the different types of sources of protein. So we have at the top there, in terms of application, the big uh, blue ball dairy meat, egg and fish is quite common. We also import a lot of soy, you could maybe call that soya, depending if you're American or UK spelling, and wheat. We also um, can grow legumes, grains, mushrooms, potatoes in the UK, but not palm, that's imported. In the particular in the Aberdeenshire area, we can see the rapeseed growing, that's the bright yellow seed that you see in the fields. We've got aquatic culture and uh, aquaculture in the northeast for algae, um, but there's, duckweed is also a really popular uh, algae source. And then we come down to the more novel products like um, eating insects like cricket, which could be ground into flour to make bread, for example, and that just would you be happy to eat your white bap or your buttery made with cricket flour instead of um, normal flour? That might be an interesting question to discuss. And then you've got the sort of in vitro meat, the lab sort of culture meats that are grown inside a lab. So would you be happy to have that instead of your Aberdeen Angus steak? So these are all quite uh, sensitive questions I'm asking here, and it often is very much driven by the individual, isn't it? So I'm always keen to hear what your thoughts are on this. And so really trying to highlight what could other sources be? Well, legumes would be a top plant protein source. These are non-meat, which um, would be peas, lentils, we use a lot of them in Scotland, beans, chickpeas, and then more perhaps exotic, we need to import then soya beans and nuts. Nuts and seeds, again, need to be um, probably imported, whether it's peanuts, pecans, almonds, pumpkin, flax. Hemp, we can grow in Scotland relatively easily. Some of my colleagues at Drowett do work there. Ancient grains are making a comeback, particularly in Scotland, I could pick out barley there, um, but there's also the other pseudo cereals like quinoa, and buckwheat we can grow in Scotland too. And then if we've got less cows, then we'll have less milk. So the non-dairy source of milk, there's so much choice in supermarkets, isn't there? The nut milks like almond milk, coconut milk, rice, rice and soy. And then the different supplements, green supplements that are algae based like spirulina or corella. And consumer acceptance, when I talked about uh, using cricket flour there, um, what would be the main drivers for changing um, your eating habits? Well, the top one that was done by this EU study, Protein to Food, was that people had environmental concerns or linked it to animal well-being, realised that they didn't need to eat so much uh, meat products, for, maybe for health, financial reasons. So um, these are some of the main reasons that people might reduce the amount of meat that they consume. And when we're thinking about uh, healthy and sustainable food choices, I've looked to the British Dietetic Association here, to give us some insights what that could look like. Really what I want to highlight is that we should be eating a diverse diet, uh, eating a wide variety of foods, and I always say eat a rainbow, so trying to have different ranges of colours in there, and then balancing your energy needs with energy intake. You should diet should be based around minimally processed tubers and whole grains, legumes, fruits and vegetables, and meat should be eaten in moderate quantities. So it's not saying that we should all become vegetarian or indeed vegan. It's thinking about how much meat that you cook and how you use it to make sure there's no leftovers, for example. Dairy products could have alternatives, whether it's the fortified milk substitutes, 
um, also thinking about the role of unsalted uh, seeds and nuts, thinking about small quantities of fish and aquatic products, um, which are certified as being sustainable, uh, having less of a consumption of foods that are high in fat, sugar and salt. Um, thinking about the type of uh, oils that you're going to be consuming, oils and fats, and a pulled out rapeseed uh, there for the Scottish angle or indeed olive oil. And then thinking about what, what beverages we have in terms of tap water in preference to um, soft drinks that are often high in sugar. So that, that kind of encompasses some of the themes that how to link a sustainable and healthy. And this is just perhaps maybe another way of showing that, that um, the British Dietetic Association produced a, a report called the One Blue Dot and produced this really nice infographic where we've got red as in either lower or reduce, green as in increase, and dairy and uh, the orange triangle meaning uh, moderate. So I'm more than happy to share my presentation afterwards, just to, this just gives you a sort of visual representation of some themes that they've picked up on. So how can we all make changes to our diet to help us eat healthily and sustainably, which is good not only for us, but the environment, eat what's in season. That's something that maybe some of you want to ask Craig about in terms of what's growing in his allotment just now. Uh, cut the waste, food waste is a big problem. Uh, I know in our household bread is something we waste a lot, but often commonly fruit and vegetables are wasted. So what can we buy in season, freeze, and then use later? And then eating more plants um, in terms of uh, thinking about how the, the livestock industry are going to be going ahead. And for example, at COP26, there was some modification of the feed that cows are fed to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. That's certainly one approach. Um, so final food for thought, where I finish off, we certainly are what we eat and it's very much dependent on how much we eat and how often we eat and it can impact on our own health and well-being but can influence the health of the planet. Now we're all experts in food because we do it every day so we should really consider every single eating episode as a chance for nutrition to positively benefit our health. So really just to finish off there to say, I'm going to introduce Craig in a minute and his recipe, I'll pull it up off YouTube. It is shared on the Rowett website. Um, I'm given the link here. If you look under um, the um, knowledge exchange tab, you'll find Craig's recipe here and the link to um, the YouTube video. And he's going to be um, talking us through Alford oatmeal, coconut and basil crepe. So um, I'm going to come out of my screen sharing and Craig, do you want to introduce that while I pull up the um, YouTube video of you doing the actual cooking? Why did you choose this? Um, well, thanks very much um, for, um, you know, asking me to join you tonight. And it was an absolute real pleasure uh, to kind of create a recipe um, using flavors that are naturally, um, you know, quite balanced. Um, and uh, I think the thing that I really want to overemphasize when it comes to uh, a recipe like this, it's absolutely delicious in its own right. And sometimes when, you know, you kind of look at the, from a nutritional point of view, or plant-based, that, that, it happens to be that, but uh, I get rather excited on the fact of kind of getting the flavors to work together. Um, and this is a great example by making some um, switch of ingredients or perhaps maybe using up ingredients. So for example, if you have someone that has, uh, that drinks oat milk, well, that uh, a lot of people may just use it um, in their, their drinks, whereas um, I've added the oat milk in the pancake batter. Um, what I have learned, um, quite often people don't uh, associate certain ingredients with certain dishes. So I'm a bit, of a, a bit controversial when it comes of uh, experimentation 
uh, certainly get to the back of your cupboard and see what is crying out to be used. And you might even discover your own news recipe. But um, I love oatmeal, I love oat cakes, uh, I love oat bread. So uh, I use, uh, and I am a big lover of coconut and uh, beetroot. So this is kind of um, an indulgent recipe for me because these are all the great flavors. Um, and uh, the local tatties, um, uh, happen to be just down the road. So it's a bit of a celebration of the Aberdeenshire land as well. This is a recipe that absolutely everybody can do. And I really hope that everyone will give me the thumbs up to say, we'll give it a go. So enjoy. Okay. Hello, my name's Craig Wilson here at Eat on the Green in the heart of Aberdeenshire, where local produce has really been at the forefront of our um, key things that we truly believe in as far as fresh food, sustainability, and of course, as we very much go even greener. So for the last 17 years, for obvious reasons, we've used the very best the land and the sea have had, that what the land and sea have to offer. Today, I am sharing a fantastically easy recipe full of flavour and with a few great local ingredients uh, to celebrate in this dish. We've got an Afford oatmeal, coconut and basil crepe. We have got a vegan cheese, lovely beetroot and kale, sticky onions and local terra tatty wedges. So let's get started. So we'll start with the crepe batter itself. We're going to use oat milk. There is so many different varieties of milk, um, but the soya, the oat, and the coconut are uh, really uh, useful ingredients to change up the flavor profile and for people that perhaps want to use, uh, to consume less dairy in their diet. So first of all, we have got some coconut milk which we have got 200 mils of coconut milk and about the same quantity of the oat milk, about 200 mils. That is the base of the batter. So um, I have uh, decided to use gluten-free flour, um, which is a personal preference, preference, readily available, um, in um, the supermarkets, delicatessens, all very, um, you know, very easy to get. All the ingredients easy to get. So we're going to um, now have one, two, three, four right, decent sized uh, spoons of the gluten-free flour. We have about a teaspoon of turmeric, a good pinch of sea salt, and three tablespoons of coarse afford oatmeal. Into the batter also, I've got a small handful of kale, otherwise known as Calonero, grows um, very locally to here. It doesn't even need a polytunnel to survive the temperatures of the Northeast. Really, really good for you. Fresh and delicious, a real kind of nutty kind of flavor. And also not quite as hardy. We have got a handful of fresh basil leaves that I'm just gonna tear into the batter mix. All, that, all that's left to do is give a good stir round. So you have got a nice light batter. Now this is optional. This is the only ingredient that doesn't make this a vegan recipe. So we have one egg. And this happens to be an egg. 
from my own chicken at home. One egg into the batter, but this batter is perfectly okay without the egg. You could substitute it with a, a, a little bit of coconut cream or perhaps a little bit of the chickpea water um, would also be good. So we're just going to blend that in and that is a simple batter mix ready for the pancake. So nice hot pan, good heat, and I'm using a local uh, Macintosh of Glendavne rapeseed oil, which I find versatile, flavoursome, easy to use, and of course, just up the road. A good splash of the rapeseed oil and get the pan really nice and hot. Now, this is the important bit. Once the pan is heated, you remove the oil into a dish or a jug. And then we are ready to cook our first pancake. This is a great uh, recipe. Children uh, love making pancakes. So it's maybe time to get a little bit more adventurous don't just make pancakes on pancake day, make them all year round and start coming up with ideas that local, local um, ingredients um, can be the filling. So once the pan is heated, remove the oil and then in a non-stick pan, a good couple of ladles and really importantly, let the batter Smooth out all around the pan until it's completely coated the base of the pan. Straight back on, maximum heat. And all that we need now is a lifter. A couple of minutes into the pan and it starts to make little, little holes so it's kind of starting to cook. And use a lifter or a palette knife, uh, not one of these hard fish slices. They just make life really difficult. So a flexible fish slice like this, or palette, or a palette knife is exactly what you need, unless you want to toss the pancake. So just letting the, just making sure that it is coming away from the edges, And it's nice and crispy on the bottom. And then it's time just to flip it over. And even, even I'm playing it safe. And because I've used the um, gluten-free flour, it's a little bit more delicate. And what I like to do at this stage is just add a little bit more rapeseed oil into the pan and a tiny bit of seasoning. You can make these in advance. So when it comes to serving them, it's a case of just pulling all the ingredients together. Flipping it over onto the plate, ready for the filling. Now for the red onion and chili and ginger jam. Uh, I strongly recommend uh, that you do um, make this from scratch. Tastes better, um, definitely less expensive uh, than some of the pre-bought ones. So uh, really, really simple, um, and you can keep it uh, in a jar. Uh, or in a tub and it keeps for a long time. So start off with the red onion and we've got the, just removing the skin and we're going to do a nice hot pan. Going to add some rapeseed oil again and into that we're going to spike it with some fresh ginger and some fresh chilli. So I have one red chili. I'm leaving the seeds in as well. I've 
got um, so for for the recipe, we have got one red onion, one red onion, one small piece of uh, ginger. I'm going to use a spoon just to scrape off the skin to prevent wastage and leaving the natural oils instead of completely peeling it. So it really is in peak condition when it goes into the dish. So it's uh, convenient and also some health benefits as well. So you've, you're, you're not get, get, getting rid of the, the lovely, fresh, natural oils just underneath the skin. So we're going to cut that into uh, matchsticks. It's quite rough. We've also got some sea salt, some turmeric again, and a little bit of red onion. Nice hot pan is always a good starting point, a good splash of rapeseed oil, and very roughly slicing up the red onions. And they go straight in the pan. And then you should hear a nice sizzle. Nice sizzle in the pan, straight in with the ginger, fresh chili. If you don't like it too spicy, just reduce the amount of chili or scrape out the seeds. A couple of minutes on high heat, and we're going to add at this point a little bit of salt, a good sprinkle of salt, about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt, and... After a couple of minutes, we are going to add one large tablespoon of soft, dark brown sugar. <coughs> We're going to let the flavors all marry together. And at this point, I'm going to add quarter a teaspoon of turmeric. And the final ingredient, some fresh mint. Two large springs of fresh mint. I'm going to use the stock as well. But this time, I'm going to really chop it down quite fine. And that is the last ingredient that we add to the sticky onions. It's ready in minutes. It's packed full of flavor, fresh and delicious. Leave that to one side and we get the rest of the filling ready for the crepe. Now for the filling for the crepe, we've still got the warm, lovely uh, sticky marmalade still in the pan. And it's important that it is still warm when we start to load up the crepe. Now, You've got lots of choices of uh, variations of what is readily available, uh, perhaps from your garden. Uh, I would definitely encourage you to pack as much uh, fresh herbs into your cooking as possible. And this is a great example. We have used basil, coriander and mint. Experiment with fresh herbs. There is no real right or wrong other than Experiment, taste it, and enjoy the flavor combinations. So we've got some fresh coriander, roughly chopped. We have some um, cooked beetroot, which can be grated, finely grated, or into chunks. And that is purely fresh beetroot, uh, uh, boiled, peeled, chopped, and grated. I'm also using raw, just washed kale, and again, very, very finely shredded, just adds a real um, freshness and real boost to the full flavor combination. And last but not least is, uh, it's called cheese. There are a few really good Scottish vegan cheese, um, one in particular is um, 
And so almost like a, a, feta, a feta style or a, a smoked cheese. So this is a lovely grated um, cheddar um, vegan cheese. So time to load up the crepe. And we have got the warm, warm crepe. And we're going to spoon on the lovely sticky red onions with that lovely spike of the ginger and the chili. We're going to load it up with the beetroot, the fresh kale, scattering of the coriander, and of course, the cheese that will be a nice flavor contrast with the rest of the flavors. You can simply have an open crepe like that, or if you're to your preference, we could roll that up like so, and then on to fresh plate. And I thought a nice addition to this would be using some leftover herbs, some kale, perhaps a few wedges of beetroot to give a nice stage for this lovely, fresh and delicious oatmeal, coconut and basil crepe with the sticky red onion and chilli filling. Any of the leftover, you can just go round the dish like that. Easy, full of flavour and great for you. And I thought, what would be a nice side addition to that? How about some local tatties done a little bit differently? So next, next up, we're going to do spiced turf tatty wedges. Now for a spicy addition, for a side order with the crepe, we have a great local ingredient, which uh, the farmer uh, has been very supportive uh, during lockdown, and he is very passionate about the humble tatty. These are a red rooster tatty, and they are grown um, with passion only 10 minutes away from my restaurant. The local rapeseed oil uh, goes into the bowl. I'm looking uh, for around uh, probably one, two, three tablespoons of rapeseed oil, one half teaspoon of sea salt, a quarter teaspoon of turmeric, and wedges washed into rustic wedges and optional extra you can add some more fresh chili i'm going to add just a little bit no seeds this time but just enough to work really well with the turmeric so a small amount of chili and give it a good mix round onto a baking tray into the oven 190 degrees centigrade for around 35 minutes. Straight into the oven. And these are the ones that I prepared earlier. Nice and crispy and ready for the table. We have got the crunchy tariff tatty wedges that is 
a lovely midweek meal that is perfectly for sharing. Although that you could say that is one portion, I think with the wedges and the substantial filling of the pancake or crepe or whatever you want to call it, is a feast in itself. That was lovely. I think um, <laughs> egg. Um, I, can't, I think I turned myself off. You can actually hear me still. I don't know how I did to manage to remove myself from the view, but um, I'll try and figure out. Oh, here we go. Show self view. I'm back. I know I'm going to be asking for a lifter from Santa Craig. I can make. Well, oh, well, well, first of all, can I say that was a very painful. 15 minutes for myself <laughs> um, and I was like I, I really would like to see what what people were multitasking doing while uh, watching that but that's absolutely okay um, but uh, uh, what they say that uh, people are not very good at listening um, so I'm going to repeat this uh, yes please make sure you ask for a pan that you really like cooking with for Christmas. Definitely uh, the, the spatula uh, can be so, so handy. And a good chopping board that you're not fighting with. Um, also, you know, and a, 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 a simple knife as well. Um, so pancakes could be the start of the next master chef yes. um, contestants. Brilliant. Okay, super. I mean, that I am um, really, I'm keen to go and try the recipe, but Chloe, would you like to um, tell us a little bit more about um, healthy and sustainable um, food systems, please, before we open up for the q and I can see some questions coming in already, which is fab. Yeah, sure. Um, I will. I'll just share my screen. Is that big enough for everybody? Oh, yeah, super. Let's start at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So yeah, so thanks Alex for inviting uh, me to come and speak to you guys tonight um, and be part of this um, part of this event. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about healthy and sustainable food systems. Um, I work at the Food Foundation um, and I'm the Global Food Systems Project Manager there. Um, so just a little bit about the Food Foundation. So we are a UK based charity that is trying to change the food system uh, so that we can afford, um, so that everyone can afford uh, and access a healthy and sustainable diet. So when we talk about the food system, um, Alex, you've already kind of uh, uh, given a really great overview of it, um, but um, just briefly as again, we kind of, we're talking about the whole food, the, everything that is, um, talking about all the processes that are on the infrastructure that's involved um, in feeding a population. So that's everything growing, harvesting, processing, packaging, consumption, logistics, marketing, food waste. Um, and our food system is also in, it very much influenced by our society um, and the economy and the environment that we live, it, live in. Um, so here on the right, this kind of ring infographic, um, you can see all the things that we need to take into account if we want to change our food systems. Um, on the outer edge are a kind, of, a kind of like the change makers. So these are people or groups who have the chain have the power to really make change happen. Um, so, for instance, we've got um, local authorities, so cities, so they can um, they can shape their urban environment by making sure that there are aren't so many adverts for junk food at bus stops or places that are just outside school gates, for instance. Um, investors can decide to um, put their money into ethical food businesses or more, more importantly, um, not invest in 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 bad, you know, in, in businesses that are, you know, have bad human rights track record, for instance. 
Um, and then in the middle of the ring are the drivers that influence or determine people's diets. So for instance, um, healthy food being un unaffordable, um, or we've got food shortages, for instance, such as the ones that we saw during COVID um, and will continue to see um, and or you know people being able to afford healthy um, and sustainable food really so at the food foundation we really work on kind of four kind of key strategic pillars and that's around influencing food policy improving children's diets um, uh, inspiring change in food businesses and increasing veg consumption um, so yeah, in terms of, I guess this is also particularly pertinent because we've just had COP um, in Glasgow, but um, one half of the kind of the food systems coin that we're trying to change is the environmental one. Um, and it's great um, that the um, the recipe that Craig's just that Craig's just demonstrated is one way that we can really start to re use um, what we eat and change and change our diets in order to kind of reduce what the impact is the impact that's having on uh, on our planet um, but food systems and the food choices we're making um, are contributing to 30 percent of total greenhouse gas emissions um, it's also decimating uh, biodiversity agriculture is threatening 86 percent of species at risk of extinction at the moment um, so you can see at the moment from this graph that if we carry on eating what we do and the food being produced in the same way, then we're massively going to miss the 1.5 degrees target. Um, unfortunately, COP, <laughs> COP negotiations means that at the moment we are also going to be missing 1.5 degrees. Um, but that's, um, that's, yeah. That's just, yeah, anyway. Um, so yeah, so one of the most effective ways that we can reduce our greenhouse gas emissions um, is by reducing our meat consumption. Uh, the U UK Climate Change Committee said that um, re eating less meat is critical uh, to, uh, to, uh, to achieving net zero. Um, and the national food strategy that came out um, in England this year recommends reducing meat consumption by 30%. Um, but like the point Alex has already made as well, it's important that this isn't about not eating uh, meat and going everyone going veggie and going vegan. It's about eating less meat, but also eating better meat. Um, and it's also important to emphasize that when we're talking about, for instance, reducing our meat consumption by 30 percent, for instance, as a recommendation, that's very much within the UK context. If we think about like the global food systems, there are certain, there are well, large swathes of the world where they actually need to increase the um, amount of animal sourced um, food that they're eating um, in order to get the nutrients that they need um, so they can develop and, um, and grow. So it's really about like um, almost like a leveling up. So within, within the UK and like rich, you know, Western countries, we need to drastically reduce our meat consumption um, to make it possible for, for those in poorer countries to be able to eat meat, eat more, eat more animal source food. So um, kind of why, why veg? Um, why is veg so important and why is veg such an, um, uh, like increasing veg consumption is one of the, the kind of the key areas that we like to focus on at the Food Foundation. And that's really because we see veg as the kind of the golden thread um, that connects, um, that's connecting diets that are both healthy and sustainable. So we know that eating veg is good for you, but uh, veg, did you know that veg low, um, the diets that are low in veg and legumes are associated with 18,000 premature deaths um, a year. Um, and also if we're going to increase, um, uh, increase our veg consumption to five a day, then that could also contrib contribute eight additional months to the UK's average life expectancy. There's also economic benefits of eating more veg. So upping our population, um, our population consumption to five a day while maintaining the same production to supply ratio would increase the value of UK veg production by 261 million pounds. Um, and if we upped it again to seven portions a day, that would add another one billion pounds to, to the UK economy. So there's like really huge um, economic benefits of eating more vegetables as well as the health 
health health benefits and then and then finally as well um on this right is the environmental benefits um so you can see at the top this this graph here shows um you know the amount of uh co2 that's produced from each of these food sources um what I find quite interesting from this is that fruit and veg that is grown in heated greenhouses is actually, um, you know, not still still small compared to beef, uh, lamb or prawns, for instance, but it's it's definitely has more of an impact on uh, on our planet than eating vegetables and field grown uh, that have been grown in fields. So what does that mean? for us uh, like in terms of what we can do that means basically trying to eat more seasonal food which is what craig's just been what craig's just been showing us as well in his in his video um so yeah so please please, please i'm just gonna just quickly just talk you through a couple of um a couple of the projects that we're doing at the food foundation and then i because uh, we could to get to some of those questions that were in the chat. Um, Peace Please is one of the projects that we that we run um, at the Food Foundation. Um, and uh, it's really about working with a whole range of different stakeholders uh, to try and get people to eat more vegetables and get more like portions of vegetables out there in the world. So we've kind of, kind of multi-stakeholder, we work with local authorities, this is through the, the veg cities um, part of Peace Please that is on the slide here. Uh, we also work with uh, citizens. So we have this kind of veg advocates program. Um, and then we also work with, uh, with media and businesses. And the stuff we do with media, um, I, yeah, I won't show it to you, but I'll drop it in the chat afterwards. There's um, basically we run like, uh, there's, uh, through Veg Power, they uh, have um, an advert advertising campaign each year, um, which is about basically trying to make vegetables and eating vegetables cool uh, to kids and make it more appealing. So trying to get rid of that old rhetoric of like kind of a kid, you can picture like a kid having to eat a horrible broccoli that they don't like and really trying to spin that on their head spin it on its head and um uh making vegetables actually fun and and uh, and a cool uh, cool thing for kids that kids are going to want to have, want to do um and then the stuff that we do with peas please is um working with businesses uh, to get them to make pledges to increase uh, the amount of veg that they are either kind of making or serving or selling. So um, we work with retailers such as Sainsbury's and Tesco's and Little and Aldi um, to uh, get them to produce, put more vegetables in their ready meals, for instance, or to make sure that they have more fruit um, at the front of the store um, or to make the, you know, have more... Um, uh, deals on 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 healthy and healthy healthy food and uh, fruit and vegetables, um, and then uh, for instance, we also work with big caterers to make sure that the food that they are providing to hospitals or to schools um, is perhaps uh, they've got more vegan or plant based options, or they also have more vegetables in the, in the dishes themselves. Um, and then this other uh, little project that or campaign that I um, wanted to share with you guys as well is uh, it's called Act for Food, Act for Change. Um, and this is a really exciting campaign that started in May. And uh, it's a group of um, there's about 30 young people around the world who who kind of are passionate on a whole range of different issues that are connected to the food system. So some of them are farmers, some of them um some of them are nutritionists some of them work in climate change some of them are more uh, focused on human rights or animal welfare so together they kind of make up the whole food systems picture um and they uh have uh started a pledge um which they're asking everyone as many people as possible to sign um and then they've also got this list of actions um which they which is kind of a list of actions that um they want businesses and governments to take in order to kind of fix our food system. So the campaign started in May um, and they've consulted with a whole load of different youth groups around the world. Um, and they've got this 17 list of actions for change. And uh, at the moment, what we're asking you guys to do or anyone who is under the age of 30 to do, I should, um, I should say, is to 
vote on the top five actions for change. Um, we've got up until December to do that. And then after the voting closes on the actions for change, the ones that get the most votes will be what this uh, group of young people um, and others will be able to use as an advocacy tool um, going forward when they're kind of campaigning and uh, trying to get governments and businesses within their own countries to, to change. So I'll, I'll, um, I will put them in the chat so you guys can have a look at all of these links that I've just mentioned. Um, but yeah, I will leave it there. So thanks very much. Thanks, Chloe. So um, that was really great to hear about the initiatives that the Food Foundation are currently doing. And yes, feel free to put in the chat um, the link. So I'm having a look um, through the chat and um, I can see some questions. Uh, so Joe, um, you were saying insect flower was mentioned, can you tell the difference? So um, I've tried insect flower, but in products that have been pre-prepared, so I've tasted it in like a brownie bar type thing, so it's been baked and then sold as an alternative um, snack bar and could I tell the difference? No, not really, to be honest, but just the thought of it wasn't it wasn't kind of appealing to me. It's not something that I would go and swap my personally, my 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 bar to, to go back to go to that brand, but it just gives you an example of how the products could be used. So that's a great question. Um the crepe recipe, um we also asked Craig, um, can you just use the oat milk? Did you just put in the coconut milk for flavour? Yeah. Um, I think there's a, a degree of flexibility there, but it was just a personal, uh, a personal, oh, sorry. Uh, a personal, a personal preference, um, you know, on, on flavour, flavour profiles. So yeah, just, it just kind of worked right with the oats for that. A bit more rounded. Oh, I've just shared the link to the recipe if anybody's interested there, so that's fine. And Craig, maybe I can stay with you then. What is in season just now? What is growing in your allotment? We're going to be supporting local produce. Well, um, it it does it does reduce considerably at this time time of the year. And uh, we've actually just invested in a little polytunnel across the road here in the school. So um, it'll be really, really handy for us to be able to use that. But um, kale is one that I would really encourage people. Um, you know, the, I think most people have probably seen about, seen kale, heard about it. Uh, or, and, and I always say, you know, go back if you've had a bad experience with kale. Uh, it's great if it's uh, fried um, and great if it's baked. Um, it's really great um, if it's included in a stir fry. So kale is really, um, no matter what the temperature does, kale is definitely going to uh, hang around. All your hardy, you know, your, like your red cabbage. Um, even like... Um, what I would encourage doing, like, you know, in this neck of the woods, we call it a neep, uh, a turnip, uh, grated, modernise it into like a warm slaw. Um, you know, you don't have to just think just traditionally. Things have changed so much. It's veg, do veg doesn't have to be just this kind of um, cousin that you occasionally like. Um, I, th I would take the vegetables very much seen as... Uh, friends and family that are around you all the time, uh, grate them, slice them, um, uh, using the different spices and herbs that you've already got around. And, um, and remember, you can boil it, you can steam it, you can fry it, you can dehydrate it. Things have changed, get adventurous, we've got, Every, everyone probably has a gadget they have forgotten they even had. So, uh, and if you're feeling really lazy, 
just put it in a nice soup. But my tip would be all your leftovers in, but maybe fry off, uh, uh, sizzle off some kale or some nuts and seeds and a bit of spice to put on top of a soup. And if you haven't had electricity for the last few days, that sounds just great. Brilliant, yep. Um, Chloe, I think there's a question in the chat for you. I don't know if you had a quick look there. Uh, Megan was asking, or she said, thank you for a very interesting session. Speakers discuss processing in the food system, the need to reduce meat consumption. What's the environmental impact of ultra-processed meat analogue products? Is that something you want to comment on or? Sorry, was that me, Alex? No, sorry. That's for Chloe. All right, oh, sorry. sorry, I started talking about was on mute. Um, still haven't learned. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on. Uh, for instance, the, because obviously all of these, all of these are like, like plant-based foods. They are they're soy. They're soy based, and the the kind of the environmental impact of that obviously is soy is is you know causing deforestation. So. Um, I'm not too sure what the immediate environmental and in terms of that graph that I was showing of like the uh, the kind of plant-based food wasn't wasn't in in there or meat analog analog products what wasn't in that in that graph. Um, so I'm not not entirely sure um, what the environmental impact of it is, but I, but the fact that. I think there is a there is a concern, obviously, the fact that um, it, all of these products are soy based and they they're you know contributing to deforestation. I think it's something that we need to be very mindful of. I think it's also interesting that um, even though there's like an upward trend in more plant based food and veganism, that isn't actually um, correlating with healthier diets and more ve more veg consumption because there's always that like traditional way of eating like meat and two veg whereas the the kind of like modern plant-based uh, meals that we're getting are don't really come with that many vegetables in them so um, there's a kind of a bit of a that we need to be mindful of actually obviously I'm need to be mindful of not just the environmental impact um, and you know how good are things for the environment but we need to think about when we're talking about plant-based diets um what that actually means in terms of health like healthiness and nutrition yeah there's also um corn as well which is a uk product which is a micro protein type product which is grown in uh, it's not it's not it is is produced in the UK as a microprotein. So um, I think that's an interesting one in terms of going forward, but it's not soy based as well. Mm. And then there's the lab based um, products where they're, uh, you know, sort of uh, in a petri dish, as it were. That's a typical sort of scientific uh, image that's come up, that comes up that you. Um, get fat, muscle and other tissue cells and then it's put into culture to grow the meat and then you use 3D printing to produce products that look a similar um, structure as meat. So that's also another meat analogue. And then the issue there is about the transport, isn't it? It's about yeah. it on then an aeroplane and then shipping it halfway across the world. So um, these all have impact, yeah. not just greenhouse gas emissions, it's about use of water resources um and, biodiversity yes so in process yeah. as well yeah mm. that's a great question um fiona um i don't know i'll, I'll let craig answer i can maybe follow up she's confused why uh we would be using rapeseed oil it is not too heart healthy so which oils are the healthiest so, well, um, I'm um, also slightly confused uh, by that. I understand that rapeseed is uh, a healthier oil. But what I would say is um, regarding um, whatever oils that, you know, you look at the uh, nutritional value and it's the, one, the, the right one for you, 
I would actually just look at it in in the context of the quantity, um, how you how you would use something. So, for example, if you were deep frying something, obviously the saturation um, uh, and the the amount is far more. Uh, I think we all know um, that if you think of a stir fry, that you need a, a reasonably small amount of oil. And I always describe it as a quick, sharp shock to the vegetables, retaining all the freshness of flavors and all the rest of it. Um, and they're not oily, it's just aiding it. Um, so I'm going to really do a politician there and go, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to uh, shout from the rooftops um, and uh, say that um, rapeseed oil is or is not but I understand that the, um, the rapeseed oil to be um, a, healthier, a, yeah. a healthier alternative. But so, uh, I think um, I would agree with everything you said there, Craig. So all fats and oils contain tap calories, whether it's mayonnaise, whether it's butter, margarine, rapeseed oil or olive oil. Okay, So they're all fats and oils. And in general, in Scotland in particular, we eat too much uh, fat and in particular though we eat too much saturated fat and that's the type of fat that will be solid at room temperature and they tend to be from animal products or contained within animal products. Um, now rapeseed oil is naturally low in saturated fat because it's a plant-based oil and it's high in unsaturated fats which is actually linked to better heart health and uh, particularly um, rapeseed oil is particularly rich source in an omega-3 fat. It's a, a rich source in alpha-linoleic acid uh, and that is linked to potential heart health benefits. Rapeseed oil, maybe this is a bit that might be confusing, it also does have a ratio of one to two the omega-6 oils um, and that's more linked to inflammation, but it's more about the ratio of the different oils that you are that you're consuming. So I think um, rapeseed oil has got a high heat um, point in terms of why it's really good for that use in that recipe and that uh, for cooking the ban pancake batter and for cooking the potatoes. High um, yes. So. I mean, um, so Fiona, the alternative would be, what would you use instead? I'd be interested to know what you use for cooking. So I actually have a range of oils in my kitchen just because they think they add different um, flavors and different um, structures. So when I'm baking, I'm often using oil, sunflower oil instead of butter. When I'm stir frying, I'm using rapeseed oil and olive oil, depending on what flavors. And then I've got some other fancy oils like avocado oil, which is probably completely unsustainable, but I quite like the look of it when, when I was <laughs> you know, for salad for summertime. So, um, yeah, coconut oil and olive oil. So yep. that's interesting that, that Fiona, you've mentioned coconut oil, because if you're going to pull out one that's saturated fat, it actually that is the coconut oil. So, um that I do have coconut oil in my kitchen and I use a tiny amount when I'm also making carrot cake because it gives that really nice mouthfeel. When yeah. it, when, so um, I know it's plant-based, but actually coconut oil is really high in saturated fat. That's why when you buy it in the jar, it's solid at room temperature. So yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. I think that's all our questions done. I can't see any more and there's none in the question and answer box, but that was just really interesting. And thanks so much for doing the cookie demonstration as well, Craig. That was, uh, I'm really Thank hungry you. now is all I'm going to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think if that's, if there's no more questions then, I'll just say thank you and we'll close. That was brilliant, really good. I really enjoyed that. Um, thank you to all our audience for tuning in as well and um, supporting our digital festival, which is running for another couple of nights yet. We've finished on Wednesday. Um, but Thanks again to Chloe and Alex and Craig for giving up their time this evening. That was just, yeah, really good. I'm waiting to make pan pancakes now. I'm starving. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for Thank having, you. having me. Thank you for Thanks having us. Thanks, Tech Fest. Okay. No worries. Okay, bye.